You want to ride this for 48 hours straight with me? 48 hours straight where? 48 hours straight? No, we'll just paddle for 48 hours. Today. Today. Here we are in the Amy Barn in Pittsfield, Vermont. It's a beautiful day. We've got uh, beautiful people. Uh, we've got wow. Colonel Thank Nye, as beautiful as it gets. Sephra, the lovely, lovely Sephra. We got Joe, who, uh, Joe's okay too. Blessings. And, and, uh, <laughs> blessings. <laughs> and unfortunately, the one that you can't see who's probably the most beautiful of all is Marion oh, behind yeah. the camera. And uh, she does a wonderful job of making us look as beautiful as she can. Work, does the best with what she's got. So sure. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Johnny Waite. And uh, this interview is actually a special one for me. It's a friend of mine, a guy named uh, Isaiah Vidal. Isaiah is a truly an elite Spartan racer. Uh, you know, um, he's one of the top of the top. And I've watched him really claw his way to get there, like really work hard. He was a strong guy, but he's become a really fast guy too through a lot of hard work. Um, but the cool thing about this, watch this video. I know his, um, his story, I hope he gets into it, about his personal story, where he came from, and, uh, and, and why he does this, and, um, and then we'll talk about that after. I can't wait. This is Spartan Up Podcast. I'm with Isaiah Vidal, arguably Spartan's greatest racer ever. Some might disagree with that, but I don't know. He's doing pretty well these days. He's eating healthy, he's big on beats, and um, I don't know, tell us about yourself. You had a pretty uh, cushy upbringing, I heard. You come from a really, Wealthy background? Wealthy background? No way. I've been poor since I was the day I was born. Really? Yeah. I would Wait, say. You, you grew up in Mexico? Where'd you grow up? No, I was born in Odessa, Texas, but you know, my family didn't grow up the way I wished it would have been like, but you know, I grew up always having to work for what I wanted. Yeah. So, well, you that's got just your, how I your, your, to it. your uh, grandparents have anything to do with the Alamo? No. No, but they did have the, uh, to deal with uh, getting all my family to the state of. Texas, of course. They got you out of Mexico States. to the U.S.? Yeah, I'm the first generation to be here in the States. What you, would your parents do before you? My parents? Yeah. My father was in uh, some bad stuff. Bad business. stuff? Drug, car drug cartel or? Oh, no, not drug cartel, but you know, he was transporting. Got it. Um, back in the day. Yeah. And then he was living in the States for like a good majority of my, of my life, for sure as a ghost, basically an immigrant, and my mother. You knew that growing up? I uh, didn't know until I was about the age of 10. Got it. And uh, Was it exciting? Didn't, doesn't a young kid want to follow in his dad's footsteps? No, I actually wanted to change that because what happened was my dad got in a really bad car accident at the age of 25. I wasn't in the story yet. On his way back to New York, he was in his truck, long bed. He was coming back from New York, going through Houston, Texas, picked up a hitchhiker, and uh, gave the hitchhiker a ride as my dad's driving over this huge and humongous bridge in Houston, the guy pulls a knife on him and tells him to get out. Well, my dad, he had a lot of balls back in the day. He's like, you're going to stab me because the guy went in to reach to stab him. And the guy, once my dad realized, like, all right, he's about to stab me, that goes over 95 miles an hour. He's going to crash into this 18-wheeler. He's like, my dad's at the time, he's like, it's not the 18-wheeler's fault. So he just drives straight off the bridge, crosses two other bridges. Last thing he sees is holding onto the wheel, seeing this guy being shredded into pieces through the glass shield. Wow. Last thing my dad remembers is holding onto the wheel, hit the ground, that's all he remembers. The truck looked like an L is what the emergency people said. He had to be airlifted through plates to the Houston hospital. He was in coma for two weeks. My grandparents didn't have enough money to, to uh, keep him alive. They were going to pull the plug on him, basically. My dad's wife at the time, his brother. This was not your mom? No. I wasn't even the story. My mother wasn't even the story either. Uh, my dad's wife at the time, brother, pitched in the extra money to keep him alive for another week. Wow. Woke up three days later. Wow. Now he's got screws in his back and he can't work. Uh, he's, and then he was he living in the States and going back and backtrack into to today. Uh, about when I was 18, I went to that big downfall in my life because my dad got deported. But he was gonna get deported either or. like. He was supposed to show up to, for court like back in the 19 something. You know, I was probably like five years old. He didn't show up to court uh, for because he knew he was going to get deported either or. So we ran from Odessa, Texas to Marble Falls, Texas. Lived there for 10 years. And then my 18th birthday, two days before my 18th birthday, my dad's cutting grass at a freaking bank. Bank alarm goes off. Cops show up wondering what's going on. My dad, my little sister's to my dad at the time. Next thing you know, uh, the cops show up, they ask for my dad's ID, because he was getting, he was trying to get money to take me out to, on my birthday. 
And sure enough, you know, they found his record, got sentenced for five years in jail, got out in a year and a half, got deported back to Mexico. Yeah. So now he's over there. And, and mom? Mom, she's back in Austin with a new boyfriend, which is, I mean, whatever makes her happy, I'm grateful. I got a new little sister, you know, it's, it's phenomenal, man. I mean, to me, it, it, whatever makes her happy makes me happy. That's just part of life, right? We all want to be happy, but. But how do, how do you come out of something like that and stay positive? Like most kids might go off the rails and start drinking or? I wanted to, I talked to my grandfather, he's about 80 years old. I thank, I thank God every day that he's alive still. But you know, I sit down with this old man, I ask him, Grandpa, what's one thing in your life you would change? When, when did you ask him this, what age? This, this was about 17 years old. You know, like right before, not now, it was actually after my dad got deported. And uh, this is one of the time, like I sat down with him, I just asked Grandpa, well, if there's one thing in life you would change, what would it be? He's like, Isaiah, I'm old, in Spanish, of course. He's saying all in Spanish, so I asked him, he starts telling me, I'm old now, I wish I had a boat, I wish I had everything, but now I'm leaving it to you guys. And it made me cry in that moment, but it made me realize I have a legacy to carry. So whatever I do, my kids have to live by that standard. So I'm doing whatever it takes to build that resume so far up, it's impossible for any of my children before my children. Of course, I want my children's children's children to be anything that I've ever done in my life. You want to set a bar. I want to set a bar. Yeah. And that's exactly what I've been doing. That's great. What I'm interested though is how does that happen from, I mean, you could see if a guy came from, or a woman came from a decent household where all the stuff you just described didn't happen. Right. It's amazing when it comes from a household that you just described, right? How, how do you flip the switch and say, I don't want to go that way? Right. So my parent, I was a big downfall I had uh, in high school. I grew up playing sports. My mom did it to, for me and my brother to have an outlet. So you're asking like, how was I living this like secret life almost, watching, having, having to be careful of what I do because my dad's a wanted, not a, a wanted criminal, I guess I would say. Well, they're just not giving, but, they're, you're not getting like the, the best guidance. Right. When, I'm seeing what my dad, like, so my dad, like, I love him to this day, but if it wasn't for my father, I wouldn't be who I am today. So my dad has strictly always pounded me, like, Isaiah, don't do this, don't do that. You know, he gave me his life experiences, so I never wanted to do any of that stuff. So even though he was doing the wrong right. things, he knew enough to tell you not to do them. Exactly. And, you know, that was way in the past, like, stuff before I even was born. You know, he stopped doing it, like, I would say five, seven years after I was born, he stopped dealing with that type of stuff business, or we'll call it dirty money and back in the day of course, yeah. um, but what made me like never go to that was because he always strictly told me it's bad, don't do it, it it'll lead you to who I am today, you know, I'll screw it up, you right. know, he always like stressed that on me, so it made me like wonder like what if I did something completely different, what if I did something way better than my dad could ever thought was possible, my grandparents, my mom, you know, I, at the time my mom was the only supporting woman of the household. She busted her butt every day, putting food on the table for everybody under the roof. So I knew that one day, like, I need to be better than my mom, better than just her. You know, don't get me wrong, my mom was supporting us, but she was just a bus driver. Like, I could never see myself with a, with a job working from 5 in the morning all the way to 6 in the afternoon. I never saw myself doing that, so I started betraying myself to be something greater, you know, striving for something better each day after that. So I started working out. My brother, one day, I was eating Twinkies, playing video games. I was... Uh, 12 years old, my brother saw me doing this. Older brother. He's 11 months older than me. And uh, it just took that day when he told me, Isaiah, you're such a fat ass, you're just playing video games all day, eating Twinkies and oatmeal cream pies. I'm like, heck no, I'm not gonna prove to him, not only him, but my mom and dad, that I can do something way better. And ever since then, I started getting off my ass, just started running, you know, started doing sports, soccer, football, made me the animal that I am today. I started doing Insanity with Sha of Shanti, you know, yeah. P90X with Tony Horton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Started doing all that crazy stuff, becoming this crazy athlete, doing all these workouts. And, little fe did and feeling good. Yeah, and feeling good. And little did I know, I was actually building this whole endurance phase because after football practice, I would go home and do Insanity and P90X. Mm -hmm. So I started like doing all these workouts and it made, it made me, got me big, I got jacked, you know, uh, didn't get a six pack, but you know, I was striving for that. Yeah. And uh, taking it from that household, I was watching my mom and dad go on this like regimented life for the next, you know, from 12 all the way to 18 years old, up to when I turned 18. That's when all, all 
I would say all hell broke loose. Dad got deported. It's just me and my mom and my little sister. My brother already went off, you know, doing his own thing. And I was just there at home all day, you know. I would go to go to uh, school, go to college, do that. And I call, I started catching myself on this routine, like, what is, you know, school's good, of course, but, you know, I may not be educationally successful today, but I am physically. So, going from that point when I was in my life, I was like, Isaiah, you're, so many people told me, because I found the Spartan race in 20, 11 of December when he did the first world championship. Didn't do the world championship because I didn't know about it, but I did the open heat and got third. And that's what really opened up to me. I was like, wow, this is really cool. Right. You know, I already had went through this depression mode of losing my dad and everything. So that brought me back up, taught me about life. You know, you know this story. I think yeah, I told you. Yeah, yeah. It brought me back up alive. It brought Spartan race basically changed my life because I started looking at like, wow, life is like a Spartan race. We go through shit. We go through life's running, running through our life. We're gonna hit an obstacle. Do we sit there, cry about it, or do we overcome, observe it, learn how people are doing it, and overcome it and keep going? And I, ever since then, I started looking at like life in that perspective. People thought I was crazy. They were like, "You're wasting your time." For the next two years, I was getting money out of my own pocket to go to events. My taking my mom was even extra money that I had to spend. Money to hotels, everything was coming out of my pocket. But it was money that I was been saving since I was a kid because I was selling candies at school, you know, making a dollar each day. And I would go to like wholesale Sam's Club and buy a bunch of candies and go to, go to school and sell them for a dollar each. So I was a little hustler back in the day. So I saved up all this money and that's what allowed me to do that. So during that course of the time, I started doing Spartan racing. Started doing these crazy events. Did Death Race, finished. 2013, finished. Then I did the bike ride. Did it? You know, I just started we, building we, that resume. We normally take breaks. We do like a burpee break. But um, <laughs> since you and I are pedaling for the next 40 hours, we're not even going to take a break. Right. We'll just keep talking if okay. that's okay with you. That's fine. What um, what would you say to the young men or women that are watching this, right? Right. And maybe they've got a crazy household like you just described. You had. What should they do to get out of going the wrong way? I mean, what attributes? What is it? Is it? What is it? For example, like I don't watch the news because it's filled with negativity. You know, I wouldn't say get out of your household, go do your own thing, because it's hard. Like when when life hits you, when life hits you, it hits you. Like it's you're on your own. If you decide to like leave your parents or whatever, but the the true influence that I've learned is get out, get out from the negativity, get out to whatever you think that you feel like is blocking you from, from doing what you really want to do in life. And for me, it was, it was my, you know, just being home, you know, being taken care of by my mom. Is, I'm going to be influenced by that. I'm going to love the fact that I'm being taken care of my mom. But if I stand up and say, I'm going to get out of here and be a man in my life and actually change who I really want to become, i got to get out of here. Of course, I'm 18. I can get out. But if you're, you know, a kid... It's, easy to, it's easy to stay in the comfort zone and stay right. home and have and three, three, three cooked meals every day. Right. It's easy. It's people, right. people want to do that. And for me, like... I, I find I, I, found, I found it comfortable to do that, of course, because in the side I was saving money. Right. You know that's smart to save money, right? Yeah. But you can only do that so long until you start to really see that that's not healthy. You need to be a I needed to be a man in my life and actually go do what I needed to do and actually start working for what I wanted. Start working towards a goal that I want to do. And realistically, for any average person, anybody can do it. You yeah. just got to get your ass off the couch, whether it be the couch, whether it be in your car, whether it be at the gym, whether it be at your work. Whatever the case may be, you, you want to get on. Going. You want to get on your feet. You got to get off your ass first. Exactly. Right. For sure. So, um, three quick tips, exercise-wise, for people out there, health-wise, um, that are looking to just clean themselves up. Three quick tips, exercise or food-wise. Like what, what? Awesome. Uh, first thing in the morning that I do is I take a hot and cold shower. Uh, to, uh, Tony Robbins does a really good. Uh, seminar talking about how hot and cold therapy shocks the nervous system allows you to burn more calories once you start hitting cold and hot water in the morning. I also drink uh, hot lemon water with a little dash of honey and that gets your metabolism going. I also do with, uh, some water with cayenne pepper, gets your metabolism going. Helps you not only go to the restroom, but it also helps you lose weight over time, of course. But first thing in the morning, shower. Second. So right out of bed, hop in the shower, ice cold, hot. Ice cold. Hot, cold, hot, cold, do that like 10, 10 reps, 10 sets, turn, up, turn it off, get your day going. Take your supplements, take, eat a little bit of, uh, for me, it's uh, usually an omelet, 
or just like a protein bar. How many eggs? Um, I usually do egg omelets, so eggs is usually like one or two. You just dash them, you know, cook and spray, dash them in the microwave. It's easy as that. Yeah, yeah. It just depends on who are, your scenarios, where you live. For those, for those listening, no microwave. I don't believe in microwaves. I don't believe in microwave yeah. either. But whenever you're in a, in a hurry to get somewhere, it's more convenient. Feed them raw like Rocky did. You don't need a microwave. Yeah, that's true too. <laughs> or make a shake. Or make a shake. Make a shake. And then um, fit the three fitness tips. Three fitness tips. Quick and easy for the people out there on the couch. On the couch. Just get, I would say, burpees. Definitely hip circle. Have you hip done circle? That? Plank hip circles, have you no, done no. before? No, no, give me one more and then you're gonna show us what a plank hip circle is. Hip circle and then, what's another one? Uh, pull-ups. Pull-ups, yeah. all right, those three, pull 10, 10 reps each, 20 reps each a day, how many? No, do at least. Uh, these, are, these are people on the couch. Yeah, I mean, they can do three sets of 10. Three sets of 10, know, so 30 of each with, with every day. Every day. All right, let me see what a hip circle is. Hip circle. I'm gonna uh, keep pedaling. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so you normally get on all forearms, have your feet wide, you circle around to counterclockwise, and then counterclockwise. 30 so of those. 30 of those, but 30 each side. So this is one side, that's the other side. I like it. What's it do for you? Abdominal exercise. Really? It's phenomenal. Yeah, I got Yancey doing, got me hassling every, every day, nice. all the time. Nice. Crazy. You're still dying for that six pack, aren't you? Yeah. I don't think it's ever gonna happen though. <laughs> You're awesome, man. Yeah. Good stuff. I thought it was a pretty impactful interview. I thought you did a pretty good job with it. Um, Thank you. I've, I've met Isaiah a couple times down at the Tampa race. He, I think he won it again this year, uh, or he won it this year in a, in a photo finish kind of thing. But I've talked to him and he's a really nice kid. Just young, humble, all the things you'd want kind of in, a, in an elite champion. Uh, so. When you start talking to him and he's t just riding a bike and he starts talking about his family and his background and his father and uh, being a, a, an illegal alien or, or a visitor or ghost or whatever terms you want to use. And then, you know, his father uh, getting deported and all. It just makes you realize you, you start talking to somebody or you think you know somebody even from afar. You don't really know what else is going on behind and all the challenges and obstacles somebody overcomes. And this, this young man, and that's what he is has had to deal with an awful lot in his life. Not unlike a lot of people in his position, but I mean, he's done it and he's managed to also, so he's dealing with all that and then carved out this career that he, you know, and has become an elite person in, in the field that he's chosen. And he seemingly has done it all with a with very good sense of humility. Mm -hmm. And you know, he's got pride in his family. He's got pride in his heritage. He's got pride in what he's doing. Um, but, but he seems again, very, very focused and very centered and grounded. Uh, you know, I just thought he was a, a pretty remarkable uh, interview. I wasn't happy to the fact that he doesn't watch the news because there's negativity on it. That may be a little bit too much. <laughs> I think you got to pay attention to what's going on in the world, especially what's going on around you. But I tell you, I thought a pretty remarkable kid. So I was just going to say two sort of behind the scenes things with Isaiah. I was really fortunate. I was working at a race in Mexico when he came down, and it was the first time he'd seen his dad in I don't know how long, like in a long, long, long time like years and years, and his dad took a bus the entire breadth of Mexico to come over and re-meet Isaiah, basically. They'd been in touch on the phone and stuff, and, and he actually watched him race. And that was a really cool experience for Isaiah to be able to be this good at something that he got to go and perform on a stage that his dad would, so that was really cool to see. But the other thing is, um, his current commitment to the sport is incredible. Like in the last year, he's gone way, way up the rankings. But what a lot of people don't get is he's just, he's kind of devoted everything to this. Like he's essentially living out of his car I'm traveling across country, race to race to race. Um, he's got lots of great friends in the sport, so he's had some places to stay and things, but he's really d devoted himself to this. And I think that's pretty, pretty remarkable. And he's just, he's a youngster. Yeah, he's, he's still got 21 it. years old. Yeah, he's still, got, he's still got a long way to go. Yeah, yeah, so um, pretty, pretty amazing from that standpoint. What, you, you, you know him and you've, um, uh, what, what do you attribute his recent success to? What would you You know, say? it's a lot of the things we talked about. Um, don't say no, don't necessarily say yes to everything, but don't say no. And he's, um, he's open for pretty much anything mm -hmm. if it's you know, healthy and uh, has integrity or whatever, he's, he's in. Yeah. He, he doesn't say no. Yeah, like riding his bike from Texas to the beach. Yeah, I said, hey, you wanna jump on a bike, it'll get you, and he, and he does it. Yeah. Moving out to Colorado to train, well, he, he does he, it. Well, 
yeah, but you're you're a mentor, master to him, you know, and he's a sponge. So I mean, you you know, you're in a position that he he sees what you've done, and again, you've you've walked the walk and done all those things. So if you say something to him like that, I mean, you've got his attention. But there's, a, a I mean, but yeah, but there's a lot of there's a lot of young guys, and, and I'm, listen, I don't know, uh, I don't know a lot. So, but there's a lot of young guys that don't listen. They have their own uh, oh, ways sure. of doing things, yeah, and but, but he's smart enough to know. Again, you, you've got to look for people who've done something, yeah, who've already sure. accomplished, who do things better than you do. Yeah, you know, and you've got to, as we talked earlier, try to emulate them, right? Mm-hmm. So he's smart enough. Forget age, but he's already smart enough to know. Okay, there's the model. How do I become the model? I, th- I think back to uh, one of the recent interviews with Bart Yasso, and he said that you have to have inspiration plus execution. And if you're providing the inspiration, you know, you're saying, hey, here's something you could do. He's got I, the execution. I've watched so many guys come through this town that you've tried to inspire and tried to help and just watch them not take it, and they yeah. leave with their tail between their legs because they're not going to do it. Yeah. So it really is both. I mean, it's awesome that he has this opportunity in this sport with a mentor, with people around him who are offering him opportunities. But you can offer a lot of people a lot of opportunities they don't take. So at the end of the day, he's still taking it, and that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's also just a time to just give a nod to how close kind of the elite racer community is and how yep. wonderful they all are and inspiring each other to, to work out and stay healthy. And, I mean, from my interactions being around any of them, they're all wonderful people. And, yeah. uh it's really cool. It's a really yeah, cool community a, that's been created. There's a huge camaraderie too because it's become a very intense competition. I mean, there's money on the line. There's a lot of pride. There's the, the points to get into the world championships and stuff. And yet, they're genuinely happy for each other. Like, it really is a community, both on the women's side and the men's side. Internationally, it's awesome now that it's such an international sport. And Isaiah, even though he's American, he has huge pride in his, uh, his Latino side. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, he considers himself representing Mexico as well, which I think is great. Um, and when I look now at, you know, racers like John Alvin coming over from the UK, and we've got uh, um, uh, Peter Zyska coming from uh, Slovakia. And, like, these are some of the best athletes in the world. And, and there's a real fraternity and sorority amongst them that, that's amazing. So you're a absolutely fraternity. right. A fraternity, per se. I tried to start one. <laughs> and, ar- and around something really healthy, <laughs> yeah, which, which is good and inspiring. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, right? exactly. So, um, yeah, so I, I would say that, uh, that, I mean, we've got a lot of great Spartan Elite athletes that we can point out and say, you know, these are very inspiring people, men and women. Um, and certainly Isaiah is, is in the top ranks of those people that we can, we can watch this sport continue to grow around. But the, but the best push the best. They recognize it in yep. themselves, you know, and they, they kind of, they kind of, you know, the cream rises to the top kind of thing. Yep. They, they recognize it in each other, and then they push each other. And yep. that, that becomes, you know, and that's how organizations get better. That's how the that Spartans going to get better. I mean, it's just they're moving at a faster pace, and they draw everybody else's in their wake, right? Oh, yeah. So everybody else has got to keep up, and that's yep. why... You put yourself in those groups of people, the whole thing about the five friends. Fi- so you, put, you are you an average people, of your five best friends. Right, yeah. and, or you yeah. know, the five people you're competing with. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you sure. know, I mean, so I, well, I that's, why Cor- that's why Cornell Wrestling brings in the best of the best. That's why these wrestling yeah, programs sure. in it, right? Sure. You have to be around the best. Well, yeah, so, and so great ambassador for the, for the brand for, the sport. for Spartan. Yeah. And um, if you want to find out more about the Spartan culture and more about this podcast, go to SpartanUpPodcast.com. Thank you for listening to another epic story of success. For show notes, video, and audio of this episode, visit SpartanUpPodcast.com backslash 068 or follow us on Twitter at SpartanUpPod. The SpartanUp Podcast is brought to you by Spartan. To find a race near you, visit Spartan.com. Spartan.